So I'm going to be presenting on something called the wabi-sabi principle, or the value of imperfection. And um, believe me, it does have to do with OER. It does have to do with sustainability. And I'll take you through that um, route to show you exactly what I mean. So um, Barbara Chow, who's up there, <laughs> uh, last year presented a challenge to the OER community and, and um, also um, presented an opportunity and a, 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 some, a commitment that we have to make within the OER community if we are going to s be sustainable, if we're going to be resilient, if we are going to survive. And that's, we need to cross the chasm of adoption. And um, what this means is more participation in terms of people that are implementing OER, more participation in terms of contrib contribution, so uh, greater contributions from traditional learning from all of the various learning communities. And to some extent, this means we need a greater diversity of participation to meet laws and policy requirements regarding learners. So learners that um, have disabilities, and to some extent, this is part of what my talk is going to be about, and to recruit a large untapped gr group of participants around the world. Many countries are not participating. The, if we look at the um, volume of participation in OER, it doesn't spread the entire globe. And um, actually, the resiliency talk that Simon gave is, is on a fairly similar theme. It was quite funny when you went through many of your slides because they look like mine. So what, what to some extent, we hope to create um, in this crossing the chasm is a virtuous cycle where we have greater diversity of contributors, greater diversity of resources. And this, of course, in effect, means that we get to meet the needs of a greater diversity of learners. The second commitment and challenge that uh, was made at those meetings was we wanted to support deep learning. And this, of course, is a challenge that isn't just an OER challenge, it's a challenge within education everywhere, and it requires a, a fundamental departure from conventional or comfortable educational practices, and it means a complete retooling of the habitual educational quality judgments, and most of us are in some community where we're talking about this particular challenge. And what I would like to contribute to this discourse on uh, um, increased adoption and better deep learning is um, a very Eastern worldview and aesthetic called wabi-sabi. And wabi-sabi is a Japanese worldview and aesthetic that recognizes the beauty in the imperfect, impermanent, and incomplete. It nurtures all that is authentic by acknowledging three simple realities. Nothing lasts, nothing is finished, and nothing is perfect. And it encompasses the beauty of things modest, humble, and unconventional. And why do I bring this up? Well, what does it have to do with learning? How many of you here are parents? Okay, how many of you have spent thousands of dollars in fairly polished, wonderful, perfect toys only to find your kids abandoning them and going to popsicles, cardboard boxes, and things that cost nothing? Okay. <laughs> um, we know that as, oh, how many here, of you here are educators? Okay. And as educators, we know that the incomplete invites completion, the broken invites fixing, the mistakes invite correction, a partial collection of examples invites more examples, and humans call forth the greatest resourcefulness and creativity when there is an immediate and urgent unsolved problems, not when all the problems are already solved. The best arguments and explanations arise uh, from disagreement and debate. Cognitive dissonance and exposure to the counterintuitive spurs growth, and we actually know, I have a teenager, that it's, it's required, despite the pain it might cause to parents, uh, for teenagers to go through their teenage developmental phase. And we all know the value of constructivist learning. We, develop learning using the mistake, the intended flaw, the inaccurate, the gap, the incomplete, the imperfect, antagonism, argument, dissent, counterfactual, tension, and contrast. And we know things like the perils of like-mindedness leave room for divergent thinking. We've probably all said this. We've heard lots of talks about how photorealism can hinder understanding and um, that we, we've used the trick of provoking uh, meaningful input in evaluations through intended flaws. And yet, we still have, in our education system, 
a valuing of the perfect and the perfect as a barrier to learning. Um, my son, last, when I said, well, think about a problem, said to me, Mom, I don't have to think about it. The textbook gives me the right answer. And uh, my daughter came home with this fairly badly done horse, and I asked, well, you, know, this is, you can do better than this. And what she says is, I'll ne never do it as perfectly as a teacher, so why should I try? I think one of the things that, as educators, certainly in higher education, and I'm presently at, or have been at a number of higher ed institutions, I, um, and I was for a period of time responsible for um, the Office of Learning within higher education institutions, and I frequently felt like I needed to take all of the faculty members back to, to kindergarten, where you get very candid and um, unedited uh, responses regarding the type of learning that is being offered. The, um, so what about OER? I mean, we are the enlightened, progressive group of educators here. We're the ones who know about deep learning, about 21st century learning, who have, we're the ones who are trying to change the education system. But what are we doing? Let's look at the majority of the OER that we are producing as this enlightened group. Um, we're creating a ton of equivalents to the sage on the stage. I don't know how many um, YouTube videos we have of a lecturer standing up there and simply giving the lecture. Um, we focus our, our energy on polished delivery and not learner engagement. When I look at the number of resources we're spending on almost Disney-like production of science resources uh, to polish it to get all of the mistakes out of there, it's, it's quite um, discouraging. We use inflexible proprietary format, file formats that con, uh, confound the creation of derivatives. How many um, flash systems are out there where, in fact, the code is not available, where nobody could ever create a derivative? Um, we fail to support bidirectional communication. Most of our resources are simply broadcast resources. Um, we do not support peer learning. We, do, we ignore the need for critical thinking. And we fail to accommodate translation into other languages and other modalities and deliver on, delivery on diverse platforms. Many of our um, physics uh, resources or all of those things actually bind the code together with the language that we need to translate. So this is the progressive community. OK, but you might say, what about standards and quality of, in education? If we're ever going to across that adoption chasm, don't we need to have standards and quality? Uh, well, Wabi Sabi doesn't say that you shouldn't have quality or um, good standards, but it recognizes that everything is imperfect and everything changes, even our notion of perfection. Uh, there's benchmarks for perfection in our curriculum can be impediments to continuous improvement. We have Voltaire's The Perfect is the Enemy of the Good, and we, we know that what is perceived as perfect often repels efforts to improve and becomes outdated and, and impoverished. You might say, yes, but wait, um, we're the new kid on the block. We're trying to persuade an entire, this resilient traditional education system that Rory was talking about. And so we need to try harder to be, per, be perceived as worthy, to overcome skepticism, inertia, and distrust. But will mimicking the status quo advance education? Are we going to achieve that by trying to be as good as or as perfect as or meet the same standards as standard education? We have a new learning reality. Um, we are in a digital economy, a knowledge economy. Education is even more critical. Um, prosperity of a society rests in large part on the educational development of its members. And we need a major shift in learning and education. We no longer need to produce human calculators. We no longer need to produce human hard drives. We, there, we have Google. We have an amazing store of this knowledge. Um, and we no longer need to produce an army of human clones to staff our factories and offices. So why are we creating educational systems that produce that? We need creativity, resourcefulness, flexibility, collaboration, communication critical thinking and independent thought. And we have a much bigger problem as well, um, the marginalized learner. If you look at any reports in any Western country, and I, I, I 
imagine also in other countries where the metrics haven't yet been gathered, there's a huge group of, group of learners that are feeling disenfranchised, do not see education as relevant, see the system as too inflexible, and do not feel that their needs are being recognized or met. This is happening at the same time as we have that knowledge economy, where education and knowledge, in fact, are so critical. One of the things that we need to learn is that learners learn differently. Learning breakdown and dropout occurs when students face barriers to learning, feel disadvantaged by the learning experience offered, or feel that their personal learning needs are ignored. And this is, has been reiterated again and again in learning outcome studies. OK, well, we have an amazing opportunity here in OER. It's all about diverse learning, isn't it? OER is born digital. We can use the plastic plasticity and mutability of the digital to make the, a huge diversity of, of resources. But dis, despite that, we tend to constrain this flexibility when we're creating OER. OER is also about more contributors. It's about pooling, sharing educational resources, about cum cumulative production and collaborative effort. Um, we want to invite participation or con contributions. We want to encourage derivatives, tinkering or refinement. We want to encourage a sense of ownership and inclusion in the process. And we want to encourage shared responsibility, which usually comes from providing valued contributions. Yet how much of, we, of this are we doing in something like OCW? Is it actually this um, ideal that we've set out for OER? So then let's move to accessibility and inclusive learning. One of the major impediments to adopting OER in, say, the US system where we have ADA and Section 508 is that it doesn't meet the um, legislative requirements regarding accessibility. It is the law, it's the policy, it's a right, it's an obligation. If we're going to enter the educational system, we have to do it. And usually when, whenever this is mentioned, everybody sort of freezes up and, and gets, or become, blushes a bit or whatever. Um, but if you think about it, the principles, and I'll tell you why, the principles of accessibility and inclusive learning, and that those horrible laws, those, uh, what we see as constraining, is in fact at the core and the epitome of the OER culture. We're talking no more um, about no more than simply taking the principles of OER and extending them as they should be extended. But the culture within OER, unfortunately, with re relation to accessibility, is that accessibility is seen to constrain creativity and innovation in both technological and pedagogical approaches. We see accessibility as counter to interactivity or more engaging learning experiences. Um, some people even say there aren't any learners with disabilities using my resources because the, our definition of what um, it's, is a disability or s requiring special services is quite constrained. Um, we are a voluntary group and therefore we're less responsive to enforce standards and we see the guidelines uh, as too complex and confusing or impossible to achieve. And for all of those reasons, OER tends to be, uh, or is not adopting inclusive design, is not um, adhering to the, rec rec the policies. And part of this is because um, in many cases we've seen accessibility as a one-size-fits-all um, system, or a system that requires you to qualify for a special service so that you can then get a one-size-fits-all special service. And Luckily, um, our objections to this are very similar to what should be and what are becoming the objections to the accessibility framework in many education systems. It is slowly being recognized that the, this notion of being qualifying as having disability, therefore qualifying for the, um, sorry, for uh, the necessary services to accommodate your disability are, dis are a disservice to individuals with disabilities or learners with disabilities because it excludes learners that do not fit into the categories. And if you think of it, when you're trying to constrain costs, you ke keep uh, narrowing the ca categories and keep narrowing the definition of what is in the categories. And then another group sprouts up and says, hey, but I have a right and I don't fit the category, so you create another category. Um, but, and again, then you have people who drop through the cracks. 
it treats learners with disabilities as a homogenous group. But if you think about it, individuals with, with disabilities are probably the most heterogeneous group of learners that there are. There's greater diversity among learners with disabilities than the standard, the standard population. It ignores the multiplicity, the multiplicity of needs and skills that affect learning. I'm jet lagged. <laughs> um, it constrains the design of learning resources. It uh, doesn't give it. Um, means that there's less leeway to address minority needs and non-normative learning styles or approaches. If we have one size fits one, you're not going to have much flexibility. It compromises the learning experience for many of the learners and services that we intend to serve. Um, the uh, design of something for someone who's blind doesn't work very well for someone who likes an image, image intensive learning resource. And it ghettoizes education for students with disabilities, making it less sustainable and more costly. So I, we've been proposing a new notion of disability. And this notion of disability is that it's not a personal trait. It's a relative condition. It's also not a binary. You're not either disabled or not disabled. Uh, disability is merely a mismatch between the needs of a learner and the educational environment and experience offered in the digital learning realm. And therefore, accessibility is the ability of the learning environment to adjust to the needs of all learners, the flexibility of education environment, curriculum, and delivery. And accessibility means that we're optimizing the learning um, environment for each individual learner. It's a relative quality. Something, a resource, a site is not either accessible or inaccessible. You don't know whether it's going to be accessible or inaccessible until you know who it's for, what the context of use is. The, and this does um, address, as well, this doubly marginalized learner. And I want to talk a little bit more about the doubly margin. Or, no, actually, no, given my timing, I won't. <laughs> um, but we do need to think quite a bit about the doubly marginalized learner. But it, this new notion of accessibility allows us to fit within accessible learning, inclusive learning, the doubly marginalized learner. So what we're proposing is a one-size-fits-one education, um, optimizing learning for each learner. And the types of learning needs that we want to optimize for include the traditional sorts of things that we think of when we think about disability in terms of sensory, motor, cognitive, emotional, and social constraints, individual learning styles and approaches as well, though, and linguistic and cultural preferences, technical, financial, and environmental constraints. All of those, if we rethink this notion, um, can be um, addressed through this. And we rely upon flexible resources to make the match. The larger our pool of diverse, flexible resources, the more likely it is that we can meet the needs of a large group of learners. What we need to do with those lar that large, flexible resource pool is um, to make the match is to transform the resource through styling mechanisms, and that, of course, has specific technical requirements, to augment the resource by adding captioning or video or things of that nature and replace the resource with another resource that addresses the same learning goals but matches the learner's specific access needs. And so in order to do this, from a practical technical perspective, we need information about each learner's access needs, information about the learner needs addressed by each resource, um, resources that are amenable to transformation in a pool of alternative qu equivalent resources and a method of matching learner needs with appropriate learning experiences. And luckily, many of the talks this morning actually had these components. And so uh, we have a project that has just begun <laughs> called FLOW, Flexible Learning for Open Education. And it's using a standard called the Access for All standard, which is an ISO standard, ISO 24751, if you like those um, sort of references. And what we're intending to do there is to design OER for diversity, to make it possible through an OER system to meet diverse learner needs. And the message here is um, it's good for you, <laughs> and it gets you where you want to go. So we're hoping that you understand that it addresses more than accessibility, because with the types of, of uh, changes and technologies that we're developing through Flow, we want to ease internationalization and translation, OER portability across operating systems and browsers, ease of reuse, repurposing and updating, improved discovery and selection of pr appropriate OER, and the ease of delivery through a variety of mobile devices, whether phones, smartphones, tablets, 
or laptops. And to Simon's point, um, we hope to create more resilient OER resources, but delivery systems as well. And um, we're trying to make it as easy as possible to implement. So we're hoping to work with all of the OER existing OER projects and create a system that's easy to integrate and easy to um, pair up with the existing systems. So um, to a more inclusive wabi-sabi OER community to cross the chasm and to create deep learners. Yeah. So yes, it's a. Um, so the ISO standard is actually a multi-part standard. Um, there's something that was originally bound to to LIP, uh, the Learner Information Profile, but since that has sort of come into not being used very much, but it's a, a method, um, a common language for describing what you need want as a learner. So how do you want things presented? How do you want think? How do you want to control things? And what augmentative learning uh, pieces do you need? And it's, it's, a, it's intended to be a portable pr preference, private preference profile, and it's been used in a number of learning object repositories and various other things. It's also uh, something that is um, being looked at for the uh, broadband plan in the US as a way for anyone to communicate how they want user interfaces and resource repositories to deliver their stuff for them. The other part of the standard, the other part of the, it's actually a three-part standard. The first is just the framework. The other half of it is a way of describing resources so that you can match them up. It's basically a mirror image but a resource description so that if the learner requires this, then this is how you can find the resource. Um, many of those things can be algorithmically determined. They don't need manual human markup, but it, it allows a record to be on the resource to say, or, or on the user interface on the delivery mechanism. And in, it's in fact, a very good point. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is those 
particular one-size-fits-all standards regarding accessibility are not necessarily the way to go. And I mean, I agree with you. Um, I'm not, by, by virtue of having a large diverse pool, each, each and every resource doesn't have to meet the, set, the, the single set of criteria. And so I, I think you're, you're actually making my point again. So rather than saying, let's have a set of accessibility cri criteria for every resource, is not the way we want to go. In fact, what we want to go, uh, the way we want to go in terms of accessibility to, is to say, do I have a sufficiently diverse set of resources within my pool that I can meet any learner that visits that pool, right? Yeah. And that, will, that may mean uh, having some resources that don't meet accessibility criteria. Yeah. And, and my, my comment follows on that. Did you have a slide on there of uh, what requires this, 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 and this? suggest to you that if education required all those things, none of us would be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if it's so required, why don't they do it in traditional universities? And why do we have to do it in not the traditional university? Uh, I guess the right. point I'd want to make it is, it's the, to, to su support this comment is uh, when you're doing something new, mm -hmm. it's yeah. not going to be done perfectly. No, of course as not. you were saying. Yeah, right. so, if you put it up, get it online, get it online. Yeah. If you can do it this way, that's great. And I yeah. do believe that our university is doing it the right way. Yeah. We're trying to do it that way. But whatever way you get it up there, get it up there, get it out there. And yeah, make exactly. It and so that's the, that's again, <laughs> thanks for, uh, that's the approach that we're taking. Um, that it's cumulative, it, it's iterative, um, and in many cases it's not done by humans, it's done through use. Um, so knowing what, are, who's, what type of learner or resource is good for can sometimes only be done through sort of iter iterative use and trial and error. Okay, now for the nasty question. Oh good, yeah. See, uh, I, <laughs> it's not really a, a, a nasty, nasty question, but it could be. Uh, because we've talked a lot, uh, and first of all, let's separate the world into two parts. There's people who have disabilities. No, I'm just saying well, it's not a binary. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> and then, and then there are people who have learning styles, and I'm just wondering, uh, because I'm not a believer in learning styles, because one of the things about all the learning style literature is is people start having these um, beliefs about themselves and their own limitations because I'm a what kind of a learner. Yeah, and I'm not so, advocating so, learning styles. So either. I wanted, would like it if you could tell us exactly what are the kinds of things that you were specifically talking about so we don't get people running around again saying, uh, we're going to get back into the learning styles because it's something we can doing this and, and matching that up. So could you clarify, please? Yes, okay. So, um, no, I'm not an advocate of learning style theory um, or all of the debates of, around learning style. And I certain, But I also don't believe that Th that disability is a binary. As Eva was pointing out, I mean, in, in a, if you were in a lecture hall here and there was someone sitting here who was blind and it's, um, they, yeah, exactly, right. They may not, in fact, be experiencing a disability here because everything was said orally and they could receive it all. But if you spoke a different language, if you are completely jet lagged, if your kids, if you're a single parent and your kids kept you up all night, you're going to have a greater impediment to learning than someone um, who is sitting here who's blind. Uh, so the, the point I'm trying to make is when we're talking about a digital uh, delivery mechanism and when we're talking about learning, it, it really is more relevant. All, all of those other characteristics may be far more relevant than the fact that I'm blind. The fact that I'm classically blind is, is immaterial. Um, so that that's... <laughs> So no, I'm not, and, and um, I, I was careful to put learning styles and approaches to try to get away from, and no, it wasn't in capital letters, the styles thing. Uh, but there is, I mean, there is, despite the debate about learning styles, we do learn differently, right? And there are, um, as we know from all of the learning outcomes research and the uh, dropout rates and all of that, there, there are uh, a large group of learners we're not reaching. Thank you, Oliver Thank you, Yuta. Thank you, Yuta. Thank you.